So um, uh, I was thinking a little bit in terms of uh, what's best to pre present in these current uh, unsettling times. And I was thinking I could reflect a little bit on, on the role of language policy um, within these times and uh, link it a little bit to the research I have been doing for over 10 years now on uh, the Welsh language um, and uh, it's circulating discourses, ideologies, and practices. And this is what I'm gonna, gonna also do now and uh, talk to you a little bit about um, to, to just um, you know, remind us a little bit of those um, yeah, transforming moments uh, that the Welsh language has seen um, and uh, struggled with and dealt with historically as well. So I take this opportunity to critically reassess language policy in times of social and political transformation. Um, in the context um, of uh, Wales, a uh, context um, of the global north, right? Um, so I'll give you uh, a bit of a, um, a quick history <laughs> of Wales, but then swiftly uh, situated within um, the context of my work. So that is the context of business. And then uh, move on to uh, the discursive approach to language policy that um, I have been working on for a while as well, and uh, with uh, with Johnny as well, with, who, who is here as well. So, um, and then I'll um, talk about two projects. Uh, project one, language policy and business. I'll focus on that a bit more because this, this is where um, most of my work was, has been centered on. And then the project two uh, is a new project on linguistic equality discourse and um, yeah I hope we'll find plenty of time for discussion and and some some outlook um, as well um, so basically I'll I'll just want to start uh, with sketching a little bit the Welsh um, context really so um, as you may be aware Wales is a bilingual country and uh, a partly devolved country of the United Kingdom and uh, we we also see a de facto coexistence of uh, English as the powerful majority language and uh, Welsh as the less powerful uh, minority language in most of the communities in Wales. So English is, if you want, often seen as the role of the colonizer or the impress, uh, oppressor um, within Wales. Um, um, and uh, Wales is often considered also a political, economic and geographical more peripheral site in relation to its much stronger English neighbor. Um, if you want, with the capital city being uh, Cardiff and um, um, various communities of Wales um, are showing also uh, ranging uh, speaker numbers and different densities of, um, of speakers. But overall, just to give you a figure, there are about 90% uh, of people who claim to be able to um, speak um, Welsh, so around 560,000 uh, uh, people and the overall um, population of Wales is about 3 million. Uh, there is also obviously a, a strong focus on, sense of, on, a, on a sense of place and values of culture, community and identity <clears throat> that we see in this minority um, context. Now, um, I cannot give you a full history of the Welsh language now, but I just uh, used this, um, this overview sketch here uh, that the Welsh Language Commissioner provided um, um, <clears throat> a couple of years back. I mean, Basically, um, what it shows us is that the Welsh language has seen a range of socio-political and economic transformations that have shaped the linguistic makeup of, of Wales over the years. So uh, just to highlight a few issues, for example, the Act uh, of the Union in 1536 deprived, if you want, the Welsh language of its official status. And by the beginning of the 18th century, the position of the Welsh language then had fallen to a very low point, though it was still the vernacular of the vast majority of its people. And from the, from the Industrial Revolution onwards, then the survival of Welsh became one of the main cultural and political themes in Welsh national life. And more uh, temporarily then the Welsh language enjoyed a revival in the 20th century throughout a range of official legal frameworks and language laws that pushed its status, its, its officiality, its usage and the speaker numbers. Now, but overall, I think we can agree that uh, Wales has been characterized by history of language decline and um, also by an overall agenda, a political agenda of um, choice a language choice that needs to be provided, should be provided uh, to 
uh, the people uh, living in Wales. So the idea lingering here is that um, in Wales, the Welsh language should be treated no less favorably than the English language. And this is taken from the Welsh language measure, the current language law that gives uh, Welsh official status in Wales. And that people in Wales should be able to live their lives through the medium of the Welsh language if they choose to do so. So you can already see there's this, this overarching idea of choice that uh, penetrates um, political um, discourse and, and practices to a certain degree as well. Now, uh, with this kind of um, ideas in mind and sort of with this historically antagonistic relationship between Welsh and English in mind, uh, I would like to discuss my first project, so language policy and business, which has been the essence of my, my work for, um, yeah, uh, for most of my academic career, if you want, for um, the last uh, 10 years, and which has recently also culminated in a book, which I'm really happy about. Um, and basically, um, the idea was, so why, why the field of business? Um, uh, the idea was to research an area of bilingualism in Wales that has received so far only little attention. Um, there's a quite a, a bit of research um, on the field of education, in the field of education, uh, the public sector and media, uh, but only limited um, a scholarship uh, that looked at the use of, of the Welsh language and the presence of bilingualism in the private sector. And interestingly here, the private sector is unlike the public sector, not legally obliged to provide a bilingual service to the public. So it's an interesting area because it's a bit of kind of a gray area, fuzzy area, and a place that needs a lot of persuasion and promotion from external bodies, promotional bodies such as the Welsh Language Commissioner or the former Welsh Language Board, to get this, this, um, this, this segment of, of society that touches upon all of us, really. It's supermarkets, it's banks, it's um, companies that provide a service and that we as customers receive uh, on a frequent basis that these are also learning to embrace um, um, the Welsh language and bilingualism. Now, um, so bodies such as the Welsh language commissioner need to do a lot of promotional activities to persuade businesses to embrace bilingualism, as exemplified here with this uh, little extract um, where the Welsh language commissioner talks about, um, speaks to pr private sector companies and talks about um, um, you know, the fact that by incorporating the Welsh language, uh, you'll be contributing to a shared vision of a truly bilingual um, country. Now, um, so this promotion is very much anchored in discourses of skills as well, a bit of competition and responsibility. So shifting the responsibility to everyone in Wales. So take uh, shifting responsibility to everyone to take responsibility for Welsh, including those on a, res uh, on a voluntary um, basis. And the bottom line here is that minority language politics becomes quite enmeshed with these um, economic or if you want more neoliberal rationalities yeah, of the economization of the social, this broader transitions that we see in all aspects of our social life, that the language can have a material use value. Now, and I, um, I was then asking, why is it and in which ways is bilingual used as a resource in corporate contexts and in what ways is this linked to potential power symmetries between the two languages between Welsh and English? Um, and um, how, how did I do that? So basically, um, Johnny and I, Johnny Unger and I had a, <laughs> had a, a long conversations about um, how to best address as well um, um, language policy research. And since we're uh, both coming also for, from a critical um, discourse analytic uh, perspective, um, we developed a discursive approach to language policy. And the essence of that approach is basically to move away from treating language policy as a, as a text-based and bounded product um, to language policy as social and discursive practice. So. Um, in addition to looking at the contents of, say, a formal policy document, such as the Welsh language measure or a language strategy that the Welsh government produces, we also need to pay closer attention to discourse as a structure and the agency that is attributed to or often also denied to certain social actors in policy texts and in practice on the ground. 
So um, the idea was with the discursive approach to um, analyze the practice of policy making, explicit talk about language, that is people's ideologies about language and their beliefs about language, and uh, also their practices um, on the ground, their experiences, etc. Now, so I did um, an online survey across rail, uh, Wales uh, with a range of private sector companies. Um, these are reported use practices, so this was not an ethnography. Um, I spent time at some workplaces, but it was not like a long-term ethnography. It's mainly reported practices, experiences, attitudinal data on the presence um, of, the, of bilingualism in, in this field. Then a range of um, interviews as part of the field work and some policy uh, document analysis of the political documents and of the corporate uh, policy documents that the companies decided to um, in implement and draft uh, themselves on a voluntary basis. And um, <clears throat> I want to jump straight to some selected findings and then um, <clears throat> take these apart a bit more and show you some data extracts as well. But uh, first of all, um, um, first of all, um, what the study showed primarily was that these corporate workplaces that I, um, I investigated, that these open up really, really strong and vital new possibilities for language promotion and use, right? And if you think about it, there is a lot of touching points with the private sector in, in, in daily life, because probably you spend much more time um, maybe going into a bank or going to a supermarket or a retail shop um, than um, going to um, a, a council office and demanding some, some, some public service, right? So there is a lot of touching points here that um, often only operate through the medium of English and where there needs to be um, a lot more investment in order to do justice to, if you want, create a more equal and truly um, bilingual Wales. Now, the, the study also showed that there is, of course, a strong focus on the instrumentality of Welsh in business. So speaking Welsh for frontline and service work was important, or Welsh was used increasingly, obviously, for creating a, a brand Wales, uh, amongst other elements uh, of branding. The language was turned into one specific element that could be um, used and fruitfully exploited. Um, Many companies reported that it was very good uh, for, um, you know, maintaining and extending public relations. Um, so the idea here really is that these essentialist ideologies about language, identity and nation that have been circulating and of course still are circulating in Wales um, become mobilized for um, um, economic purposes. Right. Uh, so language identity nation is still strong, but um, there is a use value attached to that in addition, a material uh, value. Now, um, uh, some other um, um, selected findings here. Um, bilingualism, um, and that um, relates to the point that I was just talking about with this material use value, Biling bilingualism gets commodified in terms of its use value uh, for um, the various companies. But at the same time, the companies struggle with realizing their bilingualism. Uh, repeatedly, they have stressed that they lack the human uh, and time and financial resources to actually um, provide uh, a fully bilingual service or a fully bilingual approach. Now, this is a bit of a, um, um, yeah, um, a bit of an interesting one because obviously they could set aside funds in order to allow that, but it very much depends on whether companies, um, you know, identify uh, the Welsh language agenda as crucial for their profit-making endeavors um, or not. So this idea of language choice, obviously, uh, filters down to businesses because businesses, uh, with its uh, with their overarching um, um, idea of um, having to please customers and providing a choice to them, um, want to appeal to providing a language choice as well, but only in so far as is um, you know um, deemed possible for them. So choice and language choice in particular kind of emerges as quite a regulated freedom. Um, customers don't necessarily have the free choice to choose whether they want to bank in Welsh or in English, 
because uh, some options are simply not available in Welsh because there is a lack of active offer, right? So you would have to go the extra mile when you enter a bank and demand the Welsh language form because it's not visible, it's not put on, on, on the desk or something. So there's this idea that customers need to go the extra mile and ask um, for, for the service. Um, and corporate bilingualism in this regard has very much emerged as a controlled space, and if not also a, a manipulative space, despite the voluntary realm. Uh, so choice, yes, and language choice, yes, but only to a certain extent, right? So, um, right, and what we also see is that these commodification processes operate in tandem with these more nationalizing discourses. So it's not that commodification processes have kind of replaced the focus on Welsh being important to language, uh, to identity, nation and community and belonging, uh, but these uh, discourses are now coexisting, right? And an example I would like to discuss with you is um, <clears throat> a set of transformation processes in terms of discourse that have taken place uh, at the time when I was analyzing the data. So this is on the left hand side, we have an extract from a former uh, Welsh um, government language strategy, IFPAW, everyone's language of 2003. So there has been a new policy and uh, two new documents, two new policies since then. But at the time that I was analyzing it, this, this was the um, and these were the data. And um, on the right hand side, you can see an extract from a corporate language policy document uh, of a telecommunications firm that has voluntarily, you know, put in place and drafted and, um, yeah, drafted this, this policy. And what we're seeing here is the corporate policy uh, the corporate policy document recontextualizes certain elements and especially ele the element of choice. Uh, from the national policy document, but also mitigates its meaning. So while um, EIF Pau uh, very much talks about creating um, a bilingual Wales, and in particular, a truly bilingual Wales, uh, where people can choose to live their lives through the medium of either or both Welsh or English, and where the presence of the two languages is a source of pride and strength to us all, this um, choice here, gets mitigated in the corporate language policy document. Uh, remember, this is a voluntary document, so the company doesn't have to provide this service. So choice, obviously, is fine. It's a uh, language forms part of this portfolio of, of services. It's a choice of service, with language being one, but not the only part of that service that the company offers. And uh, obviously, choice becomes a little bit mitigated. So uh, a choice of service, wherever practical and wherever deemed practical, right? So you have all corporate material that's provided bilingually, but only where, where deemed practical. So the interesting bit here is who decides over what is practical and what is not practical and to what extent and under what um, conditions. Um, <clears throat> and then I have conversations, a couple of conversations with, um, 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 with, uh, people in managerial positions uh, so, and people who also were in a position to steer Welsh language policy matters within their workplace and um, within this company. And at the top I had, uh, um, we see a little extract from a conversation I had with Nia, who is communications manager at a financial um, services provider in Cardiff. And um, here we were talking a little bit about this notion of choice and I was asking her in terms of how it materializes in their everyday practices um, because I was just really interested in, in what, the, what she thought about it. And um, uh, Nia um, uh, was saying to me that from her perspective, so she, so she said, from my perspective, I think it's just all about choice. Um, you know, you don't have to take a Welsh language service if you are not a Welsh speaker. Uh, and you don't particularly want them, but if you know they are available and you are interested in using services, then it gives you a choice, right? So um, again, we see this notion of choice quite dominant in this manager's um, discourse and the official government policy um, uh, by the time that was EIF Pau and many other <clears throat> campaigns on choice seems to have successfully uh, disseminated this, um, this ethos. And Nia is obviously here speaking from a service perspective, right? She offers a choice of service with language being one, but not the only part of that service. 
And if the customer wants them, it's okay. If they don't want them, it's also okay to her mind, right? So we see this um, neoliberal idea of, 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 of freedom, of free choice, and um, the citizen consumer who is ultimately in the end to, to, to decide. So kind of this, this shifting of responsibilities from the company uh, to the consumer. Uh, to demand a certain uh, service, and then the company can decide whether they're able to live up to that or, or not. Um, so quite less say fair here. Um, another uh, example is here from from David again you know, from the financial industry, um, and uh, his company is in is in Bangor, so in the north uh, west of Wales. So if you want a heartland of the Welsh language um, with a higher density of Welsh speakers than in Cardiff. Uh, this company is also much smaller, and um, he says that for him, the biggest challenge is this obligation of having to do it bilingually, so having to work bilingually and provide a bilingual service. His preference would be, if you want monolingualism, so either do it in English or do it in Welsh. And then he draws on this uh, close metaphor here, where he says, I'd say it's a bit like, do you prefer wearing jeans or wearing a business suit? And to me, working through the medium of Welsh is equivalent to coming to work in my casual clothes. And working in English is sort of a bit more formal and I don't feel quite as relaxed. So um, again here, um, with this clothes metaphor, we see ideologies of competence and value allocations that people classically attach to a language um, with the one being considered more casual, where you feel more comfortable and with the other one here, in this case, English, um, being identified as the more formal language um, of business. Now, um, obviously these two examples are really quite polarizing and is not representative of, of, of the broader picture, but I wanted to choose these polarizing examples to just give you a glimpse of the circulating um, ideas that are really quite manifest and have really shown as a pattern in my data that circulate around the notion of choice, this choice of service with language being one part of that. And ultimately, you know, the stripping of responsibility for the language to the customer um, and this idea of separating um, uh, choice and, 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 and considering, you know, and creating two branches really of, of, of living your life through either the one or the other language, but not really um, through a bilingual uh, fashion, right? Now, in terms of applications and implications, um, obviously, again, that's a bit um, 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 condensed here, what I try to say, but really, what came out of the study was that policy happens and impacts different levels, and our analysis needs to consider that too. So we need to really pay attention to various levels and various actors here and listen, listen to them, what, what, what they experience, what they have to say. So in terms of the companies, what uh, was uh, really foregrounded was that they need more help. They need um, more help in the sense of awareness raising. So many companies I worked with were simply not aware that there is something like a Welsh language board or a Welsh language commissioner that offers support. They offer a, a bank of terminology. They offer some limited free terminology service, <clears throat> for example or um, they offer all sorts of work in Welsh badges, or um, you know, they help you with um, setting up an advertising campaign or um, all sorts of things with your branding. So there is support here in case that the company feels they need that support. But there is this communication gap here and this lack of awareness. So many companies wish for more collaborations also between the government to raise um, awareness about the language and for the government to um, or some, you know, say my government bodies such as the Welsh Language Commissioner uh, to, to help them a little bit in putting ideas into practice. Now, um, in terms of the government, um, I think um, since the private sector is um, a very big sector of society, if you think about it, it would make sense to open up a, a debate about voluntary statutory Welsh language policy, right? Because how far do you go with uh, regulating uh, the extent and scope of bilingualism? Only parts of the private sector, very limited parts, fall under uh, the new language law, the Welsh language measures, or things like bus, electricity, 
uh, uh, water supply companies, etc. Um, does it make sense to extend that? Or is this rather detrimental if you enforce um, um, such policies on companies? So I can't say what's better, but uh, what I can say is that there need that a debate needs to be had on on these um, on you know on where these um, you know sectors can also meet and what they can do to um, to push um, for the Welsh language, right? And in terms of policies, what my study also showed was that those companies that had voluntarily put into place um, and introduced uh, those Welsh language policy documents, those corporate language documents, they actually also showed uh, a bit of higher usage um, and positive experience with the Welsh language, because obviously this policy then uh, um, provides a framework for what services are available, but also within the workplace, what employees uh, can do um, to improve their own Welsh language services or where they can go, for example, to um, study Welsh if they are uh, new learners, for example. Right? So at least such policy documents, even if they're sometimes a bit tokenistic, piece of paper, often shelled in a corner, uh, they, they can be efficient um, to make Welsh not just, to treat Welsh not just as a token, as an add-on, but to turn it into a viable means um, of business communication, similar to English. And um, yeah, so um, this was about project one, really. <laughs> And I need to, to um, move on now to project two, which I can't talk about in as much detail because I really just started this project. But um, it's a project I wanted to, to focus on uh, also because um, it ties into these broader social and political transformations that we are seeing at the moment. Um, project two is um, an international project on linguistic equality in times of political um, transition. And it uh, is led by um, uh, Mireille McLaughlin at the University of Ottawa and um, a couple of people from the University of Moncton, Annette Boudreau and Mathieu Leblanc. And um, Eva Cordo uh, and myself are also involved as um, co-investigators. And basically the idea is that sociolinguists have uh, long uh, debated that language plays um, um, a central role in the production of uh, social and linguistic inequalities. And the principle of linguistic equality is often at the center of debates in the field around place and the definition of bilingualism in carrying forward a linguistically more just world. Uh, however, very little is known on what linguistic equality actually means for both sociolinguists or applied linguists or language policy scholars and for social actors on the ground. And uh, with this project, uh, the, pr the project um, takes this, uh, the principle of uh, linguistic equality as a starting point to interrogate, um, you know, um, that in a changing political context, such as now with Brexit or, or, uh, or COVID-19, uh, different demands for linguistic equality enter, in com enter into competition with one another, either as a commodity or as a language right, and that uh, the field of uh, language policy, sociolinguistics, applied linguistics, linguistic anthropology, etc., they would benefit from a more grounded understanding of the concept of linguistic um, equality in different minority contexts. So that's the, um, the starting point. And the project as such is a multi-sided ethnography in um, in various um, minority uh, language sites that face changes in, um, um, in, in different political economic contexts. So first of all, Francophone Canada, um, with the change being that Canada enters these reconciliation debates with, with its indigenous communities. And uh, in Wales, uh, the situation of Brexit and in Catalonia, the ongoing um, claims of a, um, a separation and um, nationalistic discourses um, that are um, present. And um, we cannot say too much about the project yet because it has really just started and I guess uh, it might be the same with you, but um, um, COVID-19 has um, quite radically disrupted the, um, the data collection process and our presence in those various sites. Um, because I should have been in Wales last year and it's already 2021, so <laughs> 
it's not looking too promising and I'm, be, I'm gonna be able to go there anytime soon, but um, thank God to Zoom <laughs> and all other technical um, and digital resources that we can rely upon. We were able to uh, you know, start a little bit with liaising with people and just um, problem problematizing really a little bit the fragility of the Welsh language in times of these tran transitional moments. So on the one hand, um, we have Brexit, um, which poses a risk, a clear risk for agricultural communities in Wales that used to be a stronghold for the Welsh language. And now that um, EU agricultural subsidies break away, uh, the government needs to develop an infrastructure for people to stay in those rural areas for um, maintaining thriving schools um, uh, and businesses and also for uh, thinking, out, uh, thinking about ideas for the long-term sustainability um, of the language. On the other hand, we have the disruptions caused by COVID-19 um, and the challenges faced by Welsh-speaking community groups during the pandemic where life was basically shut down. And these challenges faced by those community groups are not necessarily new, but just um, have been highlighted again uh, by this um, pandemic. Uh, so the pandemic has just brought about um, more general challenges in relation to the future sustainability um, of Welsh language community activity. So here, just mentioning a few keywords, schools, which are usually an essential site uh, for many people, for many kids uh, and children to learn uh, the language, adult learning centres, etc. And despite the digital realm, the digital realm cannot replace um, <clears throat> the face-to-face -face, um, um, communicative practices that um, uh, usually form a vital part in language vitalization processes. Um, not to forget the lack of access to digital networks um, and um, political uh, transformations as well, for example, budget reallocations. So um, to support the Welsh economy and public services to respond swiftly to the unprecedented challenges of the pandemic, the Welsh government, for example, had to reprioritize certain budgets to, um, 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 and, and this has resulted in the fact that the language is not necessarily off the agenda, but obviously health goes first. You need to, you know, save the country um, in terms of this health crisis, and then um, you can talk about other things again, if you see what I mean, right? So there is this situation at the moment that highlights um, another level of fragility and um, which yeah is directly um, or indirectly related to um, these these um, two factors here Brexit and, and COVID-19 and um, what we're trying to do is just tracking moments of discursive and social change really in this project or oh, this is the, the thing that we started out to do at least to, to look a bit closer to reread those documents and um, I'm now picking up on this principle of linguistic equality again to just see in what ways this principle is present or not and in what ways it has possibly been also erased from uh, the um, language policy um, agenda or you know replaced by something else and just one example I would like to give you just to highlight that is that um, the language laws are interesting uh, discursively to compare because they have moved uh, from um, discourses that say treating Welsh and English on an equal basis to treating Welsh no less favorably than English. So there has, this, um, there has been this discursive erasure of the term um, equality, for example. And it's interesting for us as researchers now to interrogate that and ask, well, why? Why, why did this happen? And uh, um, what currency does the, the term actually have in this minority language community? So we were reaching out to the Welsh Language Commissioner and trying to have um, to get more insights into that. And um, again, here just some 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 polarizing examples of just some some extracts of of some of the conversations that we had with Welsh uh, language policy officers working at the Commissioner's office. But um, they were they were saying that um, or they felt a bit ambivalent about using the word. Um, linguistic equality in their policy uh, practices because Welsh the Welsh language needs more support than the English language. So you cannot think of English and Welsh being equal and treat them equally. 
was one person getting back to us, right? And the other person was saying, um, therefore, people who are trying to be equal to consider both languages um, as equal are, th are therefore not doing justice to the Welsh language. In fact, we are in an, un we are in an unequal area and in an unequal context. So um, what we're seeing here is this, this, this um, hesitance uh, towards um, actively using or talking about linguistic equality. And they were also, um, um, they were also a bit fearful of, of if, you, if you use the term equality, that this would be uh, you know, less in favor um, of the Welsh language because um, simply because of the fact that you don't start out equal. It is an unequal situation. And, there's clearly one language that definitely needs more support and more equality than the other one. And this language is Welsh. So um, yeah, this is where we are right now with this project and uh, with some of those ideas that are currently um, produced in, 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 in different stakeholder discourses or in legal discourses and in the language strategies discourses. And we continue to also um, um, you know, investigate that a bit more and also then compare that to the to the other contexts, because in Canada, interestingly, there is more talk about linguistic equality and the term is ha also has big currency and is used in political discourse. So it's interesting to ask yourself as a researcher, why is this happening? Why is there a certain erasure and a certain foregrounding um, 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 in more present in other parts um, of the world? And what conditions uh, allow for, for, for this erasure. So what is people's understanding of that? And um, to, um, yeah, to, to, to come to a close really, um, I guess um, what these two projects show is, so the one project has more or less been on, on, the, on, on the presence of the Welsh language in the field of business. And the new project is about uh, linguistic equality. Um, but um, what this project shows is that they flag up um, very, very basic questions really about bilingualism and what a bilingual or multilingual um, uh, world and country should look like. So what counts as bilingualism really and who gets to decide about the scope and the limits of bilingualism, especially if you think about my first project, so um, um, bilingualism in business where this scope and the limit of bilingualism is a, is a constant issue of negotiation. How fully bilingual do you want to be as a company or can you be or do you have to be? And uh, secondly, what counts as a truly bilingual and a truly equal Wales? And again, who gets to decide about that? Is it the government? Is it um, public bodies? Is it, is it private sector bodies? It is, is it people like you and me, citizens who language users, right? Or a conglomerate of all of those stakeholders and policy actors. And um, I guess this all gets just complicated by the fact that the politicized idea of bilingualism premised on choice and equality is much more complex in everyday practices. So this classic uh, rhetoric practice gap that we see in um, political discourses and then people's ex actual ex experiences in their daily lives. And what we also see is that there's not one type of bilingualism, but many different ones and many flexible ones and many fluctuating ones. And that there is not one bilingual Wales, which is often imagined, uh, but many different ones, let alone a multilingual Wales. So something that is actually, again, erased um, in um, the policy um, agendas um, in minority language communities, because obviously they, they center very much on the minority language as compared to the majority language. But what about the other languages? And uh, finally, that bilingualism and multilingualism is constantly evolving and in flux. So language policy and language policy agendas need to be two and need to adjust to uh, changing socio-cultural and socio-political and economic transformations um, of our time. And I think that's where I stop here as well. And uh, Dior, thank you very much for um, taking your time to, to tune in and to listen to my rambling. Sorry that the second project was not too, um, too extended, but um, we really just started. And I'm curious what you have to, to comment as well. Thank you.